Well, hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Healing Outside the Box. My name is Jean Tiberio, and here I help you, hopefully, decipher what we hear in the news that's a bit sciencey in the nutrition-related health arena, and hopefully reshape it to help you make some sense of it all. Today is part five of my series on nutrition supplements. Now, in the past four episodes, I've gone through the alphabet, and I'm up to the S's. Hopefully I'll finish the alphabet, and then we can have done with all this. Although I must say, having said that, that this has been an eye-opening adventure. Some substances I thought would be full of all kinds of benefits turned out to be not that great when it came to what the literature had to say, and there were a couple of surprises in the other direction. So let's get on with it. The last S I have for you is something called sulforaphane, or sulforaphane. Anyway, this is a molecule that was isolated from broccoli. And I think you know what I might say at the end, so I'll just say it up front. You could just eat the broccoli and you'll be all set with this thing. Sulforaphane was discovered just back in 1992 by scientists at Johns Hopkins. And since then, there have been no less than 2,000 research papers written on this topic. Wow. So there's probably something here, and it appears as there is. It has been shown to block inflammation, which is oh so good, both in terms of general health, cancer fighting, and preventing heart disease. It promotes brain health, and who doesn't want that? And has been shown to stimulate some anti-aging mechanisms. The supplement is called Broccolite, but once again, it's less expensive and healthier all around just to buy the Don Broccoli, for goodness sake. Under the teas, we have Thunder God Vine. I love the name. Thunder God Vine, or Thunder Duke Vine, is an ancient Chinese herbal medicine. This is a big, leafy, perennial plant with small pale flowers. The Chinese have used this to treat swelling caused by inflammation. I think here they are referring to something like a joint injury. The dietary supplement from the root of this plant is now being used to treat autoimmune diseases, such as multiple sclerosis, lupus, and rheumatoid arthritis. It is also sold here in the States as a topical cream for arthritic joint pain. But does it work? Surprisingly, there haven't been many studies recently regarding what seems to be a beneficial Chinese herbal medicine here. I started with the NIH metadata article and went from there into a couple of studies. The National Institute of Arthritis and Musculoskeletal and Skin Diseases, or NIAMS, did a study back in 2009. They compared the extract from Thunder God Vine to a drug used to treat rheumatoid arthritis. The particular drug here was sulfasalazine. The patients in the study reported that their swelling and joint pain improved more on the Thunder God Vine than on the known treatment. In another study, the Chinese tested Thunder God Vine versus methotrexate. That's another common drug used for rheumatoid arthritis. One-third got the Thunder God Vine, one-third the methotrexate, and one-third got a combination of the two. Swelling and joint pain symptoms improved in all three groups, but especially in the group that got both the herbal supplement and methotrexate. But, and this is a big but, there may be potential side effects from Thunder God Vine. It seems that long-term use of Thunder God Vine can lead to leaching of calcium from the bone. Additional possible side effects include hair loss and infertility. I will leave you the general NIH article in the show notes. I'll also leave you that other study that compared those two. And remember, and I know I've said this before, this has potentially serious side effects, 
so don't start anything like this without consulting your physician. Now, also under the T's, we have Tribulus terrestris. This is a tree that produces fruit covered with tiny little spikes. Traditionally, people have used this plant for a variety of potential effects, including to enhance libido, to keep the urinary tract healthy, and to reduce swelling. Today, Tribulus terrestris is widely used as a general health supplement. But does this stuff work? Tribulus terrestris, as a nutritional supplement, is promoted to produce large gains in strength and lean muscle mass within 28 days. I'll give you a link to one of the NIH studies, which I'm sure you're not going to be surprised here, showed that there was no difference in strength or lean body mass. Also, one accidental death reported. God only knows what that was about. Next, we have turmeric. As I'm sure we know, turmeric comes from a flowering plant whose root is used as a spice in Indian and African cooking. The Latin name is curcuma longa, and it is in the ginger family. The active compound is a yellow chemical called curcumin. That's why you've seen those names interchanged, turmeric and curcumin. Basically the same stuff. Curcumin was traditionally used as a dye and in cosmetics. It's been used in traditional Indian medicine, or Ayurveda, and traditional Chinese medicine. It's been used to reduce joint pain, for skin conditions, upper respiratory conditions, and digestive symptoms. Although much of the activity comes from curcumin, there are other similar compounds in turmeric that could be beneficial as well. In this country, it has been used for inflammation in painful joints. In recent studies, turmeric appeared to reduce pain in arthritic knees just as well as ibuprofen. It was also shown to reduce skin irritation than often occurs after radiation treatments in cancer patients. So we know it can possibly have some benefits for these conditions. But is it curcumin alone? Curcumin with its similar substances? Or another substance in the turmeric root that is making the difference? It turns out that this is not an easy question to answer. That surprised me because I thought the jury was in on turmeric, but I think we need more studies. Here's another thing. Although we know turmeric to have beneficial biological activity, curcumin itself within the turmeric is unstable once it hits our bodies. Another way of saying that is that curcumin has a low bioavailability, so not all that much of it hits the bloodstream in its original form when it's taken by mouth. And that's because our intestines are marvelous at breaking down substances in order to get them through that thin layer of cells between our gut and our bloodstream. But as I've mentioned, curcumin-like substances within the turmeric may differ in composition and may be more bioavailable. So it's hard to say specifically which one has the beneficial effect? And you may be saying to yourself, Gene, or Gene, I will let the scientists worry about that. But scientists do worry about it because nobody wants any harmful side effects from this or anything else because they know some people will take large doses. It's the old, if some is good, more is better, which doesn't always hold. The National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health, or NICAI, is funding research as we speak because many people are interested in turmeric for joint health. They are trying to determine how curcuminoids, as they're known collectively, may be converted in bone to substances that might have some beneficial effects on bone diseases. But what about its safety? 
turmeric may interfere with antacids such as Pepsid or Zantac. Otherwise, it is generally considered safe in the doses prescribed. So have at it with the turmeric. Under the V's, we have valerian or valerian root. Valerian is a perennial plant native to Europe and Asia and brought to North America. It says here that it has a distinctive odor that many find unpleasant. That makes me think that if you wanted to plant it in your garden, it may shoo away some pesky four-legged critters. So this is an herb made from a flowering plant. So with valerian, the plant itself can be used as an herb, but supplements are usually made from the root of this plant. People claim that it helps with insomnia and anxiety. And also, possibly, it can be used to ease menstrual cramps or stomach cramps. In studies, valerian has shown to have a mild calming effect, but does not result in excessive sleepiness during the day. I'll give you a link to the NIH article on this in the show notes. This article was basically discussing metadata, which is a fancy way of saying that they look at many studies in total, 16 studies in this particular case. Although these studies were not perfect, and the length of the study and the dose varied among the different studies, the studies in general did show that there was some benefit to sleep quality in the group taking the valerian supplement. Now, it's not clear what dose is effective or how long you can safely take this, but it does list possible side effects, and they are headache, dizziness, or stomach problems. More often than not, these side effects might occur in higher than recommended doses, so it seems safe in the recommended doses. Now, under the Z's, we have zinc. We're all familiar with zinc. It's a mineral that our bodies need for lots of things, including DNA synthesis, growth in general, energy metabolism, skin reproduction, wound healing, and immune function. So zinc is everywhere. Now, it is an essential mineral, which means that our bodies must get it from food. But having said that, most people eating a decent diet should get sufficient zinc. It's generally associated with foods that have protein. If you do have a deficiency of zinc, adding zinc supplements to your diet will improve your immune function. But is more better if you already have a sufficient amount? Well, the NIH puts out a fact sheet on zinc, and I'll give you the link to that in the show notes. They say that basically two specific groups of people that may benefit from zinc supplements. The first would be the elderly, especially those that are eating poorly. In other words, those adorable little 95-pound ladies who have an English muffin for lunch. I saw plenty of those ladies in the hospital. The second group would be pregnant women. And zinc is included in prenatal supplements that we dietitians would recommend to any pregnant woman. In your general vitamin mineral supplements in your drugstore usually contain zinc as well. Since there's no way to store zinc in our bodies, most of us dietitians would recommend zinc supplements if someone cannot eat for a certain period of time for any reason. For example, if you have the flu or you've just maybe had surgery. That goes especially for people with gastric bypass surgery. As I've said, the best sources are meat, fish, and chicken, but there are also decent amounts in beans, nuts, and seeds. Although zinc deficiency is rare in this country, it can be seen in developing nations where the poor exist almost exclusively on rice for their calories. The exception to that in this country are the alcoholics. Up to 50% of alcoholics can suffer from a zinc deficiency, as well as a thiamine deficiency. But here's the real question. Does zinc help cure the common cold? And if so, why would that be? And would it help fight off all viruses? Now, I'm taking some of this information from the NIH fact sheet that I left in the show notes. Here's a quote from them. Researchers have hypothesized that zinc could reduce the severity 
and duration of cold symptoms by inhibiting rhinovirus binding and replication in the nasal mucosa and also suppressing inflammation, end quote. It also appears that the zinc you get in the lozenges you take might be a good way to administer the zinc because the zinc lingers in your mouth and throat and could go to work on those pesky rhinoviruses. Zinc was also studied in combination with other antioxidants, vitamin C, E, and beta-carotene, in terms of its ability to delay the progression of age-related macular degeneration, which can cause blindness. In this case, zinc did not appear to prevent the onset of age-related macular degeneration, but it might delay the progression to the more severe end-stage AMD. So that is promising as well. My takeaway from this is that you should, by all means, help yourself to a zinc-containing throat lozenge, but I would not suggest taking very large doses by itself. And here's why. Zinc, copper, and iron are all related on the periodic table in this regard. They are all elements with a plus two charge. That generally means, in biochemistry land, that they can replace each other or compete with each other. Large amounts of iron supplements can decrease zinc absorption. Large amounts of zinc supplements can decrease iron absorption. You may be able to avoid some of this by taking the supplements separately. Otherwise, this is safe and can be beneficial. Okay, last but not least, we have gastrodin. And yes, I know it's a G. And truth be told, I just forgot about it. But when I read into it, I thought we should include this. Gastrodin is a glycoside or ring-like structure, and its bioactive compound is called, let's see if I can do this, rhizoma gastrodiae, also known as tianma or rhizome. This is a famous Chinese herb, I guess maybe just famous in China, that has been traditionally used for the treatment, here we go, of headache, dizziness, spasms, epilepsy, stroke, amnesia, and other disorders. Now, these are obviously brain things, which tells me that it probably has some pharmacological effect on our central nervous system. Gastrodin was first identified in 1978, so fairly recently. It's been studied for the possible benefits to people with a lot of the same things. Epilepsy, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, affective disorders like depression, and cerebral ischemia, or lack of oxygen to the brain. And that's usually caused by clogged arteries. It's also been studied in terms of its uh, possible effects as an antioxidant or anti-inflammatory medicinal herb. The problem, and this might be a good problem, is that recently there have been 81 unique substances isolated from this plant, which is an orchid, I think. So it becomes challenging to figure out what substances to isolate and put through to human trials. This herb is so interesting that I might do a podcast episode just on this herb alone. But I'll just hit some of the highlights. Okay, first let's talk about epilepsy. Epilepsy is a group of similar brain disorders characterized by frequent episodes of seizures. Now, there's plenty of drugs available for epilepsy, but none that give a clear path to a cure. In at least one major study, it's been demonstrated that pretreatment of gastrodin could significantly prolong what they call seizure latency. In other words, a longer time between seizures. And it might also reduce seizure severity. Okay, let's look at Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's is the leading cause of dementia worldwide. And it seems almost every one of us knows someone who has it. Now, last year I did four episodes on Alzheimer's disease. And I can put those links in the show notes as well. But basically, there are two types of pathological changes going on. 
One is the formation of senile plaques, and the other is the formation of tau tangles. Both of these start to accumulate and cause the death of neurons or brain cells. In this study, and I'm quoting here, they found that gastritin could significantly increase cell viability and decrease lactic dehydrogenase, indicating that gastritin could protect neurons from amyloid beta peptide-induced damage, end quote. They also did studies on mice and found that gastritin could potentially improve learning and memory in these mice after only four weeks of treatment. So that's fascinating. Stay tuned for more. Now, they've also looked into gastritin for anxiety and depression. This time they studied it in rats, and I guess they upset the rats by making them run around in a maze. Maybe it was one of those trick mazes where there's no way out. Seems a little bit mean. But what they found out was that gastritin could reverse the anxiety-like behavior in this maze test. Don't ask me how they did that, but they did. Now, for depression, you have to go with the people. They have been human studies with gastritin in depressed individuals and found that there was, in fact, an antidepressant effect. So again, good news there. Why it's doing all this? I'm not sure it's clear right now. But the doses given appear to be safe in these studies. So again, that's really interesting. Okay, that's all I have for my nutrition supplements. If you want to look back at my previous episodes, you can go to my website, healingoutsidethebox.com. And of course, if you have any questions, or want me to look into something for you, you can email me on my website contact page. Just go to my website and click contact at the top. So until next week, be well and stay tuned for another episode of Healing Outside the Box. 